The meeting is called to order. Well, good morning. I know we're up here performing. <laughs> I feel like I'm on the stage and you're back there. We can still see you, though. <laughs> um, and I know it's just a few minutes late. apologize. I had some car trouble this morning, and um, my husband brought me here, so I may need to hitchhike home. So. Um, <laughs> I figured you could. But <laughs> um, so good morning, and Mr. Manager, this says a welcome from you, and I would just like to welcome everybody. I know we're going to be here all day, and it's there's a lot of material we're going to cover, so I appreciate you coming, and we're going to feed them lunch, aren't we? We are. All right, we're going to give them give, give snacks them as well. Okay, very good. So uh, <laughs> good morning, everyone. All right. And we're going to make up that time we lost uh, very quickly because I'm not going to take half an hour in uh, remarks. But I want to thank everyone for joining us, whether you're with us here at the theater or watching remotely. I know we've got a number of employees and others that are watching remotely from home. This is a public meeting uh, of the uh, Henrico County Board of Supervisors. It's my honor and privilege as county manager to kick off the supervisors retreat for 2023. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a jam-packed agenda that the chair alluded to, and it will cover a variety of issues affecting our community. Now, before we dive in, I know we've got some newcomers as well, so I want to provide a little bit of context. So this is our board's sixth retreat. In each year since 2018, they have stepped out of the day-to-day, week-to-week, and month-to-month -month grind to focus on issues at a macro, not a micro level. This is intentional and allows them to develop a work plan for the upcoming year. You simply cannot address the toughest issues if you're working only meeting-to-meeting, -meeting, work session-to-work session. This time today will be used for the board to wrap its arms around issues in housing, education, public safety, planning, transportation, and the environment, to name just a few. In past retreats, they have discussed sports tourism, community revitalization, public transportation, pedestrian safety and accessibility, They've discussed the future of the Belmont Golf Course and improving residential drainage and addressing our capital needs through a bond referendum. Mm -hmm. You know, and because they took time in a previous retreat, this county has made significant progress in each of these areas. Consider, if you will, just recently the affirmative vote in last month's bond referendum. By an average of 87%, voters approved the plan that was put forward to reinvest more than $511 million in our schools, parks, fire stations, and other public facilities and neighborhood drainage. That's just one example. So in this county, this board does not shy away from the tough issues. And our board certainly isn't afraid <clears throat> to ask the tough questions or to challenge us, the staff, and I certainly hope that we're up to it in this next day and a half. Our retreat discussion is planned, but it is by no means scripted. And I must commend <clears throat> our board members because this would not be possible without your vision and leadership. So thank you. And I want to thank the staff, take a moment before we kick off the retreat, that actually did made all of this happen, if you will, from a logistical standpoint. And there's a lot involved, not just setting up a couple of tables and chairs up here or getting, you know, a caterer, but all of the technology that is involved, dragging all of this uh, up here and making it seem seamless for a day and a half. So I began, um, once again, Holly Zinn, thank you. I, I called you out with the... Uh, Retreat, Victoria Davis, <clears throat> Tanya Brackett, Kelly Gerard, Adam Schwartz, Matt L Landwehr, Mary Paz Laco, Angie Huband, Kenny Mitchell, and Athena Plaka. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for everything that you did. To the deputies, 
Let's be nimble today. And to the agency heads, this is an exercise. Uh, again, this is not scripted. So please do everything that we can to answer the questions that are posed. And if not, we will be able to provide answers. But I'm going to ask Deputy County Manager Mike Feinmel for Public Safety to come forward and kick us off with this first presentation that involves hotel motel challenges. You will see Eric Lebo, Chief English, Joe Emerson, and Anthony Romanello. And I know Perry Miller is here as well. So without further ado, Mike. Thank you, sir. Madam Chair, members of the board, Mr. Manager, Mr. Tina, thank you for, for having me this morning. Um, as you see on the agenda, you're going to hear several topics re re regarding hotels in Henrico County. My plan this morning is to give you some insight into what our advanced plans are with the Hotel Motel Task Force. This is a task force that I've worked on for several years and now in my new role with the county have the honor of, of providing a little more leadership with the role. Uh, Mr. Lebo, who the manager already referenced, uh, has worked very closely with me uh, with our game planning for the task force and has worked on, on components components of this presentation as well. Our goals are to fit uh, the, the, the goals and, and the opportunities provided by the task force into the county's overall strategies. Um, I will, will speak and just give you sort of our overall strategies and then you'll hear uh, after I speak about some specific ideas. Um, so the issue that, that we're presented with with our hotels is that our hotels have become de facto rental housing for many vulnerable populations. Uh, we, we have hotels really in, in three different segments of the county, but we're focusing our, our efforts and our conversation today on Eastern Henrico Hotels and Western Henrico Hotels. Um, the Eastern Henrico Hotels we found now are aging. Uh, they have substandard living conditions and, and many are functionally obsolete. Uh, many of the buildings are decaying. Uh, there's an issue with lack of maintenance and upkeep. Uh, we find many zoning violations and primarily or, or a large percentage of them are permanent residence violations. People living in these hotels much longer than code uh, permits them to do so. We find a high number of calls for service. I'm going to speak more about that, uh, which create public safety concerns. And you're going to see in a few minutes the obligations that have been placed on our first responders, police and fire, as a result of these high number of calls for service. Uh, with respect to the Western Henrico hotels, uh, not as much of a problem with aging and deteriorating, uh, but the zoning violations are still prevalent there. And again, many, many, many permanent residence violations and many, many, many calls for service for, for fire and for police. And again, I'll talk about those. You see on the screen um, a, a graph that's or a bar chart that's been developed. Uh, the 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 first design of that bar chart is to give you some insight into the burden that's being placed on Henrico police and Henrico responders uh, as a result of some of these problems that we're talking about. <clears throat> I'm going to ask in a few minutes Chief English to come up and we'll talk a little bit more about the details of that. Um, the Can I ask a question real quick? Yes, ma'am. What is the definition of budget hotel? I mean, is it the cost of the, the stay or is, are they the ones that are the... The um, one week stay. I mean, no, man. We're we're talking about the price per night okay. and and being a lower end price per night, okay. as opposed to you know, one hundred twenty five dollars, one hundred fifty dollars that you would expect for other stays. So it isn't just the ones that that um, are leased or rented for one week stays. No, ma'am. No, right. ma'am. Just the, the price per night. Stay. Extended stay. So <laughs> yes, it's not just okay. Thank you. Many of the extended stays still maintain price levels that are consistent with what we would expect for. For other hotels, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Quick, quick um, question. Quick question, Madam Chair. Um, you go back to the first slide. Um, this one, sir. Eastern Rico hotels are aging, have substandard conditions, and are functionally obsolete. Clearly, we can see that from visual um, rabbis. But do you have? I don't need a nail. But is there data? Yes, sir. Um, that can um, validate this. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. So at some point, I don't know if it's a meeting or what, but I'd like to see like where exactly we, where exactly are the worst parts. Yes, sir. All right, thanks. Can, can do. Yes, sir. Um, to go back to the slide again, and, and, and again, it, it's somewhat dramatic showing you the increase in calls for service in 2020 and 2021. 
and I'll speak to a little bit more as to why that's the case. Note that in 2022, the data is only through September. Um, so while you will see in, in, in later slides that there has been a decrease in the number of calls or service, obviously we're not at a 12-month time frame. We're only operating on the time frame up until September. So the, the high calls for service, what's driving the calls for service, is a large concentration of individuals in these hotels with high needs with substance use problems, with mental health challenges, and these are leading to calls for services in, in the way of loitering, prostitution, drug use, drug distribution, domestic violence, neglect issues, and fraud-related issues. These are all leading to the increased number of calls for service, and again, the, the chief will join me in speaking about that a little bit more here in, in a few minutes. So who is living, who is staying in the hotels, who are we talking about? Um, four different types of group um, where, that, that are, are occupying the hotels these days. First of all, we have individuals that are occupying the hotel as their primary residence. I spoke with a fire marshal about a month and a half ago, and he told me about a family that he interacted with who'd been living in a hotel for nine years and had reconfigured the hotel room and the furniture in their hotel room for their permanent living. That's That's not what we can put up with. That's not, that's not what we want. We've got to find different alternatives to, to living other than a family raising their children in a hotel room for a period of nine years. Um, to drop down in the lower left corner, we uh, see people that are placed by homeless service organizations, many of which are outside of Henrico County. Many are, are other organizations in the 804 area code, um, but are utilizing the benefits of living in Henrico County and placing individuals in Henrico County hotels. Uh, transient hotel guests uh, in the lower right corner. Um, quite frankly, I mean, a lot of that's what we want. We, we want people to be transient coming in and out of hotels, um, staying there for, for issues, a hot water heater breaks, or I'm traveling or I've got family coming in town. They're occupying hotels. Um, but then in the upper right corner, you see people placed by crisis stabilization programs. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit at length about that. That is the single biggest driver of the difficulty that we're seeing. If you remember the previous slide, I talked about folks that have mental health issues and addiction related issues. Those folks are being driven by crisis stabilization programs into our Henrico hotels. Just to give you a real quick overview of what a crisis stabilization program is about, it's a Medicaid funded program that's really supposed to provide mental health services, not housing, for a period of 7 to 14 days. Um, Again, the idea is not to pay for housing and lodging. Um, due to COVID, localities in Central Virginia saw a large increase in hotel placements. Um, this had benefits for hotels, hotels that were worried during the pandemic of being able to fill their rooms to keep their business model operating, suddenly had an influx of revenue coming in with folks being placed by the crisis programs. Uh, it was an opportunity for providers to recruit individuals who were homeless for a crisis service. And I'll, I'll be frank with you, it wasn't just homeless folks. It were folks that had houses, but an opportunity to participate in this program and live in a hotel paid for by somebody else was appealing to them. Uh, and I, in, in my previous job, interviewed many people who um, had a Medicaid number, had a, a residence, and said, look, I can go stay in a hotel. This organization will pay for me to, to live in this hotel. I'm going to take advantage of that. Uh, we found that providers, these crisis stabilization programs that were supposed to be providing hours and hours and hours of service, uh, uh, of transitioning folks that had mental health issues into more supportive environments were not providing those hours. The oversight was by, by the state, by Medicaid, was not there, and they were utilizing the the appeal, the hook of a free hotel room to be able to bill Medicaid for this, but not providing them with the support that they needed. Um, so this was a common denominator in, in the calls for services, a common denominator uh, for some of the blight we've seen and the issues that I spoke about on the previous slide. We talk about folks that are living in hotels um, long term. There's a number of factors that are pushing them into living in hotels long term. And this isn't something that we can address um, today. It's not something we can address next week. It's not something we can probably address in a year, but it's something we have to chip away at, chip away at and see if we can make progress to change the mindset and to change the experience of people living in hotels. 
Um, some of the push factors we talk about is that as, as a wage issue. Wages are not keeping up with the cost of housing. Uh, there's a rental unit shortage um, all across the country, and, and it's specific in Enrico County as well. Um, hotels are being used as a stopgap stop gap for homelessness and congregate sh uh, sheltering. Uh, again, we find p providers are pla placing people temporarily, but those folks, once placed in a hotel, stay there. Um, if, if it's a seven to 14 day stay, that seven to 14 days that's being paid for by another organization extends out to months and to years with other ways of, of trying to hustle up money for people to stay in those programs. Excuse me, sir, um, Madam Chair. Um, so I see the word provider repeated. Um, talk more about providers. Sure, there's different types of providers. And we, we, in one realm, we're talking about homeless organizations that are trying to keep people off the street and they're placing them in hotels as a way of getting them off the streets. Most of these organizations are legitimate. Most of these organizations are trying to do the right thing and they're, they're falling on the only response that they have under the circumstances, which is to put somebody in a hotel. But we're also talking about illegitimate providers as well. We're talking about organizations that are recruiting people homeless, mental health, addiction-oriented folks, and placing them in these hotels and then walking away. And they're using the ability to, again, I use the word the hook, the ability to promise a hotel, put people in a hotel um, as a way to, to sub supplement their business model, um, but they're walking away and creating more problems for us. So what's, what's the benefit of an illegitimate group? You recruiting get to, people, putting them in a hotel, what, how do they benefit off of that? Because you get to bill Medicaid for 10 hours a day of services that you're not providing, and you're using the hotel as your recruiting method. Okay. Yeah. Um, we find that residents, again, who are, are don't have the wages to keep up with long-term housing um, are paying most of their income to stay at the hotel. That, way, that For that reason, they're unable to save for permanent housing options. Um, obviously, folks are living in substandard conditions and higher crime environments. We find that hotels often don't uh, comply with landlord-tenant law, and we find that folks that may be um, ineligible for other HUD programs wind up staying in these hotels. Wait a second. <laughs> so what you're saying is that what they're doing may be um, kind-hearted, but it's illegal? Is that what you're saying? They're going ahead and paying for those extended days? I'm not even going to say kind-hearted. Well, I mean, or, well, you know what I mean. They yes, think they're doing the right thing. I, I mean, I, that, I'm trying to... I think there's some, ma'am, I think there's some illegitimacy there where it's a straight-up recruiting technique to keep their business models going. Hmm. Do you have any statistics or something on yes, that? Yes, ma'am. You do? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Because that part, you, you know, you, you want to take care of people, but that's what you're getting at, is yeah. that they're not doing it the right way. Yes, ma'am. So, Absolutely. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Madam Chair, if I may. Um, <clears throat> so we have illegitimate people, programs putting people into the hotels. Once that happens, and I am assuming that Henrico has to step in and start providing providing services of all sorts of different means, yes? Yes, sir. Any idea what that costs us a year? I don't have an idea what that costs, sir, but I do have an idea of the impact on law enforcement, which I'm going to show you in a few minutes. Okay. Um, but yeah, I. Obviously, the, the problem is astronomical. Could we get a rough number on that sometime? Yes, sir. Because uh, yes. that, you know, for someone to run a scam on the federal government, which is what these people are doing by putting someone in and, and not providing the services but charging for the services, um, there has to be a cost to us. Yes, sir. And, and that's just not right. Yes, sir. And, and to be clear, the scam is actually on the state government. The, the funding comes from the federal government to the state government. The state government doles it out. There was an article in the Times-Dispatch a few months ago that the Attorney General's office and, and the state government are aware of this and are, are investigating this. So it's not, the, the, this is not revolutionary. This is known to individuals on the state level. So, Mike, one more question. And yes, I, this might be for Mr. Lebo down the line or something. Um, and I'm sure my colleague is going to bring this up probably in a deeper dive question later. Um, well, I'll, I'll just leave that for him. The 
a resident staying at a hotel, even if it's $20 a night, it's still going to be $600 a month, $700 a month, $800 a month. It's not, um, it doesn't make sense uh, from, a, from a cost standpoint. Um, Mr. But, I, but I know it's immediate. Yeah. I know it's an immediate place of, yeah. So we're, we're talking more about this. We, this has been an issue. The manager knows this. I've been talking about this, particularly on Williamsburg Road for as long as I've been elected, how most of these hotels on Williamsburg Road are not for um, tourists or business persons. They are long stay um, places. And it, there has to be some partnership then with the with the owner and and these companies that are connecting people to these spaces, et cetera. It, it, yeah. So I know we need to I know we're already clamping down on some of this stuff, but this is probably something that we need to yep. be a little bit more serious about. Not just punishing the owner, but working with the state, federal government, which I'm sure that we're already trying to to do. Uh, to provide care for the homeless community, um, et cetera. So it's, it's a couple of different avenues to this. But. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Brett Nelson, uh, Mr. Lebo actually prepared this slide, and he and I worked together on this. If you, if you want him to come up and talk at this point, I'm happy to have him come up and talk and answer any specific questions. But it, this is part of the game planning that we're doing. Um, so the challenge, as, as and I'm sort of bootstrapping on, on what you said, the challenge that, that we are faced with with dealing with folks in this situation, um, and, and this came, as you see, there's a photograph on screen that came from the Times-Dispatch and came from information on the Times-Dispatch, is that the um, rental market has really been impacted by the past few years. Um, the eviction moratoria significantly impacted attrition within the rental market. Low vacancy rates and high demand have created a rental housing supply issue. We find that landlords are more risk averse post COVID. Uh, we find that, that situations involving rent and utility arrears, credit history, lack of documentation create barriers for mainstream housing for, for vulnerable populations. And we find that the number of short term rentals uh, in the market are impacting the number of longer term rentals in the marketplace all issues that, that contribute to the difficulty in folks finding long-term housing. Uh, so we have a task force, and I think um, many of you have already identified what our goals should be and how we're going to work going forward. Um, in short form, there are two goals, and then there is a third. Um, the short form goals are we want to return our problem hotels to their design purpose, which are short-term stays. Uh, our second goal is we want to break the cycle of occupants using hotels for their primary residence. But then the additional goal that goes with that is that we have to avoid unintended consequences. Our efforts can't result in creating blight. Our efforts can't result in creating homelessness. We can't make family situations worse. We've got to operate within the first two goals but not create more problems as we go along. Um, Breaking it down a little bit more to objectives, um, there are six. Uh, one is to navigate people towards more healthy and stable housing options and services. The second is to educate owners, managers, and operators on county code, on business, building code, on zoning codes, and best business practices. Um, third is to pursue targeted code enforcement. Four is to address the criminal activity going on at these hotels. Five is to target fraud. I've sort of given you some of, of the insight into the fraud that exists. And then six is to pursue redevelopment. And you'll hear after I speak about some redevelopment ideas. Um, to, to be more efficient in our resources, uh, we've talked, the chief and I have talked, and, as well as others in the task force, about developing certain enforcement zones with targeted enforcement strategies. Uh, we're also working with the building inspector and the fire department to develop specific strategies based on the data that we've got. And I've, you know, I've obviously been asked twice already, do you have data to support this? And we are in the process and have a great deal of data that we've already collected um, showing what our enforcement strategies should be. Uh, we want to focus 
on community needs. We want to focus on regional efforts, focus on county priorities such as tourism and housing, um, and recognize that different zones of the county present different enforcement strategies. Um, if I can, I'll ask Chief English to come up now. Oh, oh. don't go anywhere. Um, hold on, Chief. I'm not, I'm not leaving. But. Yeah. Um, okay. So, I'm, Dan has a question. I have a lot. He, he has a whole lot of questions. I'm be making notes. I was, right. Mike, I was waiting for, for a yeah. good time, and this might take the collective group to kind of answer. Mr. Manager, these are – it's just brainstorming. I don't think it's an answer, and I'm not even sure it's a question. It's a, it's a, it's a circle of them. I guess I, I'm asking to follow the money a little bit So on how this works because, like Mr. Nelson said, it's, it is conf – I don't know, confusing. It's complicated as to how – we, we fund, as a county, some of these providers, right? Some of these groups, we, we, we provide them dollars to support their efforts, correct? Or non-departmental, I'm guessing? All right. And these providers collect from the federal government through, like you said, they're pr providing care through Medicare. They're collecting dollars. And they are paying these hotels for these people to stay there while they keep the rest of the money that they are collecting, I'm guessing. Yes, sir. All right. So the hotel never going to say a word because they're getting steady income from these providers, right? And they're covering whatever their costs are via getting those straight dollars from the providers. The providers are keeping the rest of the money, the tail now, end. So there's, there's a little bit of a disconnect in the premise because it's not universal. So we have, when it comes to homelessness, we have groups that we provide funding for. These are not the groups that are taking advantage right. of the Medicaid. They're the good ones. The, right. The, the bad ones came about, uh, what, just three, four years ago? Right before COVID. Right. So the good and the bad, though, they're, they're putting people in these residences because they, that's their, it's a housing option. And they're paying the residents for that. The, 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 the resident, quite frankly, could not be, might not be paying at all. That's right. Right. More than likely they're not. So they're not going to say anything about it because they're living in free housing. That's right. And they don't want to get kicked out. The bad providers aren't going anywhere because they're making a lot of money on the tail end. That's right. And the hotel's not going to do anything about it because they have a steady stream of income and they have a dilapidated property and they, it's working. Their business model is working. So I guess my question is, is, is this, and there's a bunch. So... Is there a way to reset the deck and utilize these properties um, and with a little more control over them? Obviously, that's what we're talking about. Um, to provide a more healthy and a stable condition by, is there, is there a way to identify uh, the good partners that are willing to take a step forward in a public-private partnership that we've been so successful with in so many other areas and close the loop? Like, can we take control, purchase these properties as a public effort, find a private partner that would manage the process to provide housing for these people the correct way with workforce development, with all the things that we could give these folks in an effort to help them get back on their feet, where, whereby we don't have to, we take the middleman, the owners of these hotels out of the process. We take that piece, those money, that money making piece who doesn't care out of the process, find a public-private partnership window whereby, and I don't know the answer of how, whether we own the property, whether we buy the property, we renovate the property, but we create a place that a private partner can operate to do this correctly with the funding we offer, with the correct federal f support, and we thereby have control over the venue. Mm -hmm. The, and, and there has from a condition be, standpoint, there, there has to be models, and I'm certain that they are across the country. And again, we're just hearing this presentation. We know you guys are working on this stuff, so maybe you, we probably have jumped a, ahead of the presentation. So I'm sure you probably going to offer these options. Yeah. So I, I, if I can add one thing, at the CEO CAO dinners, we've been discussing with the regions about. We you, they had suggested a hotel, and the manager has been consistent, saying we need to build something, a, shelter. a we, we shelter. We, we so did. there has been discussion regionally. We started that when when, when I was yeah. chair, and, and you there, we did. And, Unfortunately, and I it hasn't moved forward very. Quickly. Just quite frankly, our model of what we what I believe this county can do, mm -hmm. I'm 
I don't want to say I'm tired of waiting for the region to get it together. I, I am. <laughs> I'm tired of waiting. All right. So I'll, I'll second. I, I just we're very good at when we do things and, and we have proven your group has proven to be very good at fixing things. And, you know, I just believe that. Well, again, you're right. I think we jump. I would just say that I, I, I have confidence in this group, this county to take the bad actor out and skip that step. I just wanted, good morning, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, Mr. Manager, Chief Trachina. I just wanted to point out that the, the bad actors that we're talking about, so there are homeless services providers that will pay for a one week or two week stay if there's a gap between when someone can move into an apartment or a permanent housing option. Those are not the folks we're talking about. These are crisis stabilization, mental mm -hmm. health providers. Mm -hmm. These are private organizations that are paid by the state, Medicaid dollars. They're not homeless services providers that we fund with our non-departmental or our federal funding. Um, our folks are usually in there temporarily just because they may need some bridge to some permanent option. The other thing that we've already done, we've engaged an organization, Commonwealth Catholic Charities, to help people in these hotels to navigate them to permanent housing options. So we've already started a process. They've already done 51 assessments of households that are living in these hotels that we're talking about. So we have a plan in place that we're implementing um, to really relocate these folks to help them transition. So there is a plan that we're working now. So question for you, Mr. Lebo. Yes, sir. So a couple of years ago, well, this is probably yeah, maybe close to a decade ago now, there were a lot of, um, uh, God, um, groups that were opening up um, group homes for young people, and then they were charging Medicaid, et cetera, and then it, be it became abusive, Medicaid locked down on it. Some people end up going to jail and everything over this type of stuff. Has this gotten to the point where the state sees that there is a manipulation of the process and they are involved in investigating these type things. And yes. if, if not, can we help them, I guess is the question. Yes, that's yeah. happening. Yeah. You're yeah. right now, so I'll take that because actually that's something that I worked on and okay. I continue to work on. We're actually a little bit past where you're at in that our police, and our police act, quite frankly, were the first ones that noticed this okay. and brought this to people's attention. And we actually have been working with the Attorney General's office, providing them information, working collectively on trying to help facilitate exactly what you're saying. Right, perfect. Yes, sir. And Mr. Schmidt, one thing I should tell you is that during the course of the past couple of years, as some of the hotels have found the problems um, with this hotel, the problems that I'm talking about, some of them have on their own, and some of them have by instigated by county officials said, we're not going to work with these crisis agencies anymore. Um, it creates a burden on our hotels. It creates a burden to our other guests creates damage to our hotels. So we have proactively, and you'll see the, the results of that in a few slides, but we have proactively been able to cut off some of this business model by working hand in hand with the hotels. Yeah, I just, I guess my overall thought is there might be a, as a private business owner, there might be a private business model whereby if a private business knew that a, a governmental jurisdiction was willing to support the effort, there might be a model there whereby a, um, a partner could run these facilities more so that we could, you know, it, not so sure the ongoing operation funding can't be done by the way it's being done now with legitimate care and legitimate Medicare services being provided. Yeah. But I, I just, I think there's an opportunity for a private business owner and the government to get together and solve the problem. Yes, if you, sir. if it, as, as one, as one quiver in the bag, you know? Yes, sir. So you, you are Mr. Schmidt, Mr. Nelson, um, as usual, ahead of us. I mean, um, you've got Anthony Romanello here for a reason in this case. We are using the EDA in a way we've never used it before. And so when we get to Williamsburg Road, that becomes a real conversation. Perry Miller's here. He's done something that's never been done before at the airport. So we literally are looking for multiple avenues. The public-private aspect, you're absolutely right. So some of these hotels may end up, we may end up buying them, redeveloping, using some sort of development partner. But all of that is coming about. And Mike was, you know, Mike's efforts in the Commonwealth's attorney's office, really, he couldn't talk about until just very recently. But now that the attorney general is involved, I mean, this is a significant 
fraud case okay. that is, you know, basically originated within our county. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. So now is the time for, for Chief English to come up and, and we'll show you the, um, some of the trends for calls for service that we've had. Um, again, the, the next slide is probably more instructive because it shows the trends, but um, I'll let the chief talk about what we've been seeing on Broad Street and what we've been seeing in the Williamsburg Road hotels. Thanks, Mike. Well, good morning, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, County Manager, Chief Chichina. Um, just going to provide the next few slides, just going to provide some statistical data as it pertains to what we're seeing in, uh, in our hotels. And, and let me just preface by saying that uh, a lot of our focus uh, in, in law enforcement has been on our problem hotels. Uh, our directed action response team, our DART team, and our patrol officers have been really, really focused on uh, our, our hotels because we are receiving a lot of calls for service from those locations. And we also send out, you know, we send out a notification letter uh, to those hotels when we start to see a tremendous amount of calls for service to try to get them more involved and try to rectify some of the issues that we're seeing at those hotels. So with the, with the, uh, the data that you see, you already see the uh, trend here. It's uh, near to date in 2022, there's been 971 calls for service at the hotels in, in West. Now, uh, if, you, if, if you factor that out through the end of the year, you're talking about uh, approximately almost 1,300 calls for service uh, based, on that, based on that trend. So, uh, and then in the uh, year to date, uh, 107.8 calls for service, as you see, you know, was low in 2018. Again, as has been mentioned, you're seeing a lot of the hotels that have been occupied a lot more uh, due to COVID, and you're starting to see a lot more drug and mental health issues associated with those hotels. All right. Uh, and then we go south. Uh, 452 calls for service through the year September, a little bit over 600 if you project that out to the end of the year. Uh, calls for service at, the, at our South Hotels, mainly, again, the focus is on the Williamsburg Road Corridor uh, in those hotels. And then the average, every for, for monthly average is uh, 50.2 calls for service uh, in, our, in our South Hotels. And again, uh, that trend has been fairly steady. Uh, over over the uh, period of time, again, the uh, the focus has been really on mental health and uh, and drug drug usage at those particular locations. Chief, sorry, uh, I don't know if you can answer this question. What's the proportion of hotels? I don't know, Mike, if you can answer this, or Eric. What's the proportion of hotels that you are responding to in the West versus the South? Many more in the West. Yeah. Now, I know, I can see that, but I'm saying, how many hotels per? So is it? three times more hotels in the West versus the South that, that you guys cover, I guess is what I'm saying. These that, numbers are disproportionate. Yeah, that's, pre that's probably pretty accurate. It, uh, okay. At least two times more, probably two to three times more okay. in, in, in West and South. Any other questions associated with the data? All right, thank you. If there's one, if there's one thing I, we could ask for as a follow-up, if possible, is a map with with like a dot matrix of where these are. Yes, sir. Like how many there are? Are there are there eleven? Are there seventeen? Are there six? And where you know where they exist? Um, because one really outside the box thought, you, Mr. Manager, you mentioned Perry here. Good to see you, sir. Uh, like, what's the better, maybe better and best use? Like, if we were able to acquire property and we were able to work with a developer. Perry has a workforce issue just like everybody else does and workforce housing right across the street from his airport and housing for, for folks who work in that corridor. And what's the better best use of these facilities if we were able to find private public partnerships somewhere in there to, to, have, to have a win come out of those properties for our corporate partners, our county businesses, things like that. And it's just another, another, just another thought, but a dot matrix might help us identify where those opportunities might, might lie. Yeah, Mr. Schmidt, I've got a list here in a, in a few seconds I'm gonna show you of, of what our goals are and our objectives going forward. And one is that I want to conceptualize better the data points and create a, a SharePoint site or some other uh, site that's gonna capture all this data. And so I'm happy to get input of what information you would help with decision making and things to add into that data collection. Um, so there we go, perfect timing. Um, implementing our task force goals, um, the first is to work with IT and to develop and expand that data sharing platform that I spoke about. Um, as you're getting a sense, we want to continue to coordinate county efforts to provide services to long-term residents, working more on wraparound services and, and task force involvement. 
um, coordinate with non-governmental entities if they can help us with these projects, connect the hotel management with task force leadership, set out expectations, uh, talk about these partnerships that we're already talking about, um, engage with hospitality organizations and associations, and, and I threw in there an additional goal of engaging with colleges and universities, particularly those that are in the hospitality industry. Um, let's learn what we don't know. Um, Henrico County and the Richmond area can't have been the sole uh, or so location throughout the country that's had these issues. Um, are there other avenues, are there other answers that, that we don't know that maybe folks uh, in, in the academic setting um, could help us with? Um, and also, you know, maybe we can uh, assist with pathways to employment uh, with folks uh, at the undergraduate level um, in, in this field. Um, some additional goals, and, and lastly, and, and I'm happy to answer any other questions um, at, at this point, uh, I'm going to work on and, and work with the county attorney's office on researching legal authority and other jurisdictions approach to ordinances and requirements. Is there more that we can do with our ordinances to um, focus hotels into the model that, that we are hoping and expecting of? Um, talking with individuals on the state level and proposing uh, legislation that enhance the criminal nuisance status. Right now, in Virginia, all the criminal nuisance statutes only focus on drug-related charges. If we can include other uh, nuisance-related charges, such as prostitution, it would allow for enhanced enforcement activities by the police. Uh, talk about increased sanctions for code violations and whether or not repeated code violations and repeated thumbing and nose at efforts to, to get hotels to, to make their business model better uh, can result in adverse effect on business licenses. And again, as I referenced, future collaboration with the hospitality industry. Um, Mr. Romanell is here and, and as the manager told you, is, is ready to talk about some of the next phases, but happy to answer any more questions uh, anyone has for me. All right. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Mr. Romanello. Good morning, Madam Chairman, members of the board, Mr. Manager. Mr. Feinmel shared our approach to addressing the challenges posed by the hotel <clears throat> and motels along the Williamsburg, Williamsburg Road corridor as well as uh, throughout the county. And I will discuss uh, today just very briefly some efforts that we've begun to uh, look into how we can incentivize redevelopment and investment in the area. We focus on a very narrow spot just by the airport on Williamsburg Road between uh, Laburnum Avenue and Airport Drive. You'll hear from Mr. Emerson just a minute on a much broader swath of the Williamsburg Road uh, corridor. Earlier this year, uh, we did a market study on this key area of the Williamsburg Road corridor between Laburnum Avenue and Airport Drive. We built on the work of the Hotel Motel Task Force as well as the work that the planning department did in their uh, overlay for the airport area, again, that you'll hear about here in just a few minutes. We worked uh, to identify potential reuses in the area. And what the market study revealed is three key areas of focus for this area right by Richmond International Airport. One would be health and life sciences, both community health as well as biotech and laboratory uh, support services, professional services. This part of the county does not have a good inventory of office space, a good inventory of, uh, <clears throat> of hybrid uh, space also, particularly in and around the airport. We think that would be a very good opportunity for folks who want to come in and have meetings and then fly uh, immediately out of the Richmond area. And then thirdly, mixed use uh, development, which there does seem to be a very strong market uh, for that in the Williamsburg Road, Road corridor. These are just some uh, quick, fixture, quick photographs of sites in the area that you may be uh, familiar with and some of the problem properties that uh, Mr. Feinmel was referring to uh, earlier. Here's another set of uh, photographs of sites along the Williamsburg Road corridor that we think have uh, strong potential for redevelopment. The good news for the property owners in this area is that the Board of Supervisors and the county have given them some really substantial tools to redevelop their properties. The enterprise zone, the, the airport area is in an enterprise zone. It's also part of the uh, HIP zones, which was launched uh, earlier this year. And with the board's recent amendments to the real estate tax abatement, commercial real estate tax abatement, there can be a 15 year real estate exemption uh, for an exterior corridor hotel or a motel that is torn down and replaced with another use. 
a couple of uh, success. AJ, before you move on, the yes, hip sir. zone, just um, I'm going off memory. There was a statistic that you quoted recently. What was it for every dollar? It is every dollar that uh, it's such a good one. We're, you're going to hear it later today, too. Uh, okay. every, <laughs> every dollar, uh, every dollar, Mr. Manager, in uh, in uh, county funds is leveraging eighty eight dollars in private uh, funds in the HIPSO. Yeah. And I have to give Mr. Lebo and his team credit because they're implementing that program. And a couple of success stories that I'll, I'll share with you that are hip zone. This is a Shamin Hotel's uh, property. It's a $10 million private investment. This is our first building permit fee waiver granted within a, a hip zone at 500 West Williamsburg Road, just across the street from uh, the Richmond International Airport. We think this will help drive additional redevelopment in the area. And then uh, I also want to mention in the uh, western uh, <clears throat> part of the county, we had another HIP zone application, again, for uh, a property that is greatly in need of development. This is 8008 West Broad Street. It's uh, back behind Broad between Parham and Hungry Spring. We provided a $30,000 grant for the redevelopment of that hotel. It'll get a Holiday Inn flag, and the private sector is investing just under $8 million into that hotel. Where is that, um, where's that resident in uh, Marriott in the process? They, uh, I'm sorry, sir, they just pulled permits, sir. Just pulled, okay. All right, so speed, just, just jump the planning commission to the Board of Supervisors with that one. <laughs> it's fine, fine with me. <laughs> That's all I have, ma'am. Mr. Emerson is next. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board, Mr. Manager, Mr. Tina. Uh, Reverend Nelson, the, uh, the hotel's already through the uh, rezoning and plan of development stage, so it's actually at, uh, at building permit at this point. Good. I'm here this morning to talk to you a little more about the topic of the morning, the Williamsburg Road corridor. And as you know, it's a major artery for Eastern Henrico. It serves vehicle traffic, transit, pedestrians, and bicyclists. It's also an area of the county that continues, that we continue to focus on when we think of new development, redevelopment, and incentivizing investment in our community. Williamsburg Road stretches from the city of Richmond to the New Kent County border, but today I'd like to focus on the area between the city, city and Beulah and Nine Mile Road intersection in Sandston as it is the part of the corridor that we believe could most benefit from additional evaluation by county staff. The Williamsburg Road corridor has a long history of planning studies, and the reason for that is because it is an area that is a vital gateway into the county for visitors to the region, and it serves as a central commercial center for residents in the vicinity uh, studies have been conducted to determine potential challenges and opportunities for existing and future development over the years. For instance, the Sandston Commercial Study, completed in 2002, made recommendations regarding policies that could enhance the core commercial area of Sandston. These enhancements have been incorporated into rezoning cases that have occurred since that time by requiring features such as sidewalk and pedestrian lighting. Building on that study, Sandston and the Williamsburg Road Corridor were both identified as revitalization reinvestment opportunity areas with the 2026 plan when it was adopted in 2009. Envision statements guiding development approvals was included in the plan along with action recommendations to further evaluate the corridor. This additional analysis and review was done in multiple ways including the Sandston Historic Area Survey and the design charrette hosted in 2019 at the Sandston Recreation Center, where stakeholders came together to provide a vision for the Williamsburg Road adjacent to the Richmond International Airport. And of course, that resulted in the form-based overlay being placed on that property. Building on the form-based design charrette, an alternative overlay district was incorporated into the zoning ordinance amendments approved last year. This overlay allows additional uses by right, provided certain design requirements are met. 
This incentivizes redevelopment of existing properties and supports other redevelopment tools, such as the Enterprise Zone, the HIP Zones, and the updated hotel and motel redevelopment tax exemptions. There is also an existing sanitary district in the area, which could be leveraged to provide upgrades to the corridor to help spur reinvestment. And just a reminder, you've got a few of the illustratives from the, um, the charrette for the form-based overlay. We have five form-based overlay districts in the county. And what those are, they're overlays that allow you to jump up to a higher intensity zoning category if you're willing to meet the criteria of that, that zoning without going through additional rezonings and legislative process. You go straight to site plan and plan a development and from there you go on to your building permit. A good example of that is Virginia Center Commons. And we have plans moving forward under the form-based uh, process at that location now. So there is great opportunity here. We did work with several of the hotel motel owners in the corridor. One of the designs you can see on the slide that we came up with to, uh, to illustrate how a smaller hotel, and so, along with uh, taking the site to other uses as well, could redevelop that site and really improve the corridor and the, uh, the prospects of the property owner. The investments that we see potentially in this corridor. Excuse me, Ms. Emerson. Yes, sir. Would you be so kind to go back to the previous slide there? Uh, would you recap again the importance and significance of the Henrico Investment Program? Yes, sir. I think I would um, ask Mr. Lebo or Mr. Romanella to come back and talk about the uh, the HIP zone if they want to go over those parameters. They know the they know that program better than I do. Yes, Mr. Thornton. Um, the HIP zone program is really modeled after the Enterprise Zone program with some flexibility or increase, increased assistance around the demolition. Right now, with the Enterprise Zone program, the demolition grant max is $30,000. With the HIP zone program, uh, it can go up to $100,000 to help with some of the larger um, buildings or properties that need to be demolished. But it pretty much mirrors the, some of the same incentives that the uh, Enterprise Zone program offers. For example, design assistance, the uh, parking lot paving grant, signage grant, et cetera. So that's one of our newer tools that we have to work with. Yes, as Mr. Romanello mentioned, it was launched in January okay. of this year, right. and Thank it you. has been um, tapped okay. into already um, with you. permit fee waivers in particular. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Going back to the potential investments that we see in this corridor that could happen, they include pedestrian enhancements such as sidewalks, streetlights, and landscaping. Improvements for transit users and to existing street infrastructure could also be considered. Investment in the built environment along the Williamsburg Road corridor would clearly demonstrate the county's intent regarding revitalization. It would be a clear signal to those considering private investment that Williamsburg Road is a focal point for future redevelopment in Henrico. And remember, I'm talking about from the Beulah Road, Nine Mile Road intersection in Sandston, west to the city line. To examine that, take a look at it, see what we can do to improve it. I think a good example is um, a project that was funded by the Commonwealth Transportation Board for the city in the, um, the early 20, I think it's 2010, 2011 on the Midlothian Turnpike from the Chesterfield line moving into the city. They made significant uh, investments in Midlothian Turnpike, they added sidewalks, lights, landscaping. We could do similar things here, only I think take it to a higher level. And that, um, that would, would bode well for the corridor. Well, and to that point, Mr. Emerson, members of the board, go back just um, to that prior slide. So as you look at things like sidewalks and street lights and bus stop improvements, you are going to, you have the ability of using multiple funding sources here. You all are talking in GRTC about bus stop improvements, sidewalks we have, you know, we have money in the budget, you have CBTA dollars that Joe's going to touch on, both regional and local. It literally, I, I think the, the culmination of these plans will result, need to result in something like this. So we have multiple, there's not one way forward. We have multiple paths forward. 
as to how to do this. With all that in mind, uh, with these factors, we do believe it is appropriate to continue to look at the Williamsburg Road corridor, involve the community stakeholders, and determine if additional steps could be taken to spur revitalization in the area. Uh, we do recommend completing a new and updated analysis, pulling all these studies together, looking at the new tools that we have available to us to make things happen in this corridor. Uh, so that would ensure that we are tracking existing incentives and evaluating their effectiveness. And I think we could also look at including the expansion of the form-based overlay or any number of other policy recommendations. We're hopeful that that continued focus would lead to real results that would help transform this gateway in the county. As the manager noted, we've got an opportunity here with the form-based overlay. The sanitary district that currently exists could be expanded and changed to fit the entire corridor or larger portions of the corridor. That could fund sidewalks, it could fund lighting, it could fund landscaping. You have the funds, the uh, local and regional CVTA funding sources. Uh, Route 60 is a state road. You also have CTB funding. So there's a lot of opportunity here. We've looked at this corridor a lot over the years, and we've always utilized those tools when we had new rezonings and development come forward to us by the private property owners in the private sector. Um, this is taking those studies, combining them, and suggesting that we take the next steps, that we become a little more active in the corridor. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them. Before um, Perry comes up, I'm going to ask um, Kenny, if you can pull up that spreadsheet. I think, Mr. Schmidt, we have the answer to your question, uh, 12 hotspots, 12. Um, so I'm just going to give Kenny a minute to see if he can pull it up. Hotels, hotels. There we go. So see what you can do, Kenny, to make that a little bigger for these old eyes. Yeah. And there's a top row, I'm sure, with like headers, what those numbers mean. Is it number of rooms or number of residents? That looked like row. Regency Inn was a major offender. <laughs> Force mention, and if um, Eric, uh, you could come up to explain uh, this this spreadsheet and what the columns mean. I think that would be beneficial. Yes, thank you, uh, Chief Tretina. Uh, Kenny, could you zoom out to the headers, please? I'll scroll up to the headers. There should be some headers at the top of that spread. Yeah. There you go. So the this is what we update monthly with calls for service from an HPD perspective. We also, uh, HFD updates these numbers. We update information related to zoning issues, building code issues, and we're tracking this uh, monthly just to see if we notice any upticks in any one particular hotel. Um, as uh, the manager mentioned, there are 12 hotels. I think there are eight in the uh, western part of the county and uh, four in the uh, eastern part of the county to answer Mr. Nelson's question. But we're constantly tracking this. Um, we do a lot of outreach efforts. So we're engaging people that are uh, at these hotels to see if we can connect them with services. So to the extent that they may need food assistance, they may need some mental health services, other services. Um, there's a team of folks building inspections, and I'm going to probably forget someone. I apologize. But HPD, our department, the fire department, social services, mental health, we are constantly engaging these folks, trying to get them connected with services. So we're tracking this information, and we're really trying to address the issue that was shared earlier. I think this, that's awesome, and I don't know how they got that out here quickly. So thanks for sharing that. Can we, if we can, in the future, get two things? Can we get it put on a map with the dots showing where we are in the county? Number one, number two, can we add a column or two on there that shows number of rooms? Uh, if you click for Kenny, size and scope, 
Kenny, can you click the West End Hotel information tab at the bottom? We have that information as well in the same spreadsheet. So if you go to the bottom tab there, Kenny. So we have number of hotel rooms, Perfect. acreage, year built, and zoning in that same spreadsheet. Those are good size. 141, 124, 118, those are decent size facilities. These will all pay the TID. Except, uh, yeah, they all will. They all what? They'll all pay the TID. Yes, exactly right. <laughs> well, they'll be required to. <laughs> and uh, absolutely, we can develop a map that kind of plots these locations for you, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. Morning, Madam Chair, uh, members of the board. Uh, Morning. <laughs> Mr. Manager, um, Perry Miller, uh, the uh, President and CEO of the Richmond International Airport, or rather Capital Region Airport Commission. Is there a movement here? Okay. So the Capital Region Airport Commission is responsible for the management of uh, the Richmond, of your Richmond International Airport. And uh, confession for you, light it up a little bit. I, uh, in middle school, I might have been known as a person that might cut up a little bit. And to, uh, to bring me back on track, I had a coach. I used to play football. Coach Jackson would mitigate that by making us memorize a poem. The poem I was required to remember was The Six Honest Serving Man by uh, Rudy Kipling. Any lapse of memory was met with a swift application of Woody. Woody was a paddle about this big. It had holes drilled in it. I don't, remember, I don't I didn't know what the holes were for now. I know now. So judging from uh, the audience and people in the, I think you might know what corporal punishment is. Uh, I was often the receiver of that, but I did remember Rudyard Kipling's Kipling, the six on a serving ring. So I use that still today to kind of guide my presentation. So today you should hear uh, the who, what, when, why, and where we're going to do things. Maybe not in that order from Rudyard Kipling, but I still remember that thanks to Coach Jackson. So the first thing we'll do is talk about who we are. I've got John um, Rutledge with me, who's my chief operating officer, to talk, call, talk about the, the other elements of Rudyard Kipling's uh, six honest serving man. The obvious, is, obvious question is, uh, the answer to the why, is that the airport is often viewed as the front door of the Richmond region. And as the front door, we are very interested in, in what that front door looks like. It is oftentimes one of the factors of a business making a determination of whether or not they're going to move their company to this region. And so we're very interested in making sure that we're able to live up to our vision, which is to move people, business, and commerce to advance the Richmond region. The Capital Region Airport was formed in 1975 uh, with, the, with the commission. It has 14 members. Uh, some of you are here, and those, some of them, you have served on the commission before. Uh, four members are represented from the Chester, uh, Chesterfield County, four members from Henrico County, four members from Richmond, and then two from Hanover. The board member uh, executive committee is comprised of Wayne Hazard, the chair, James Holland is the vice chair, Charles McFarland is the secretary, and your own uh, uh, Commissioner Nelson, Board Supervisor Nelson, to you guys, is the treasurer. I'm the president. Uh, we have an ec a $2.1 billion economic impact in the community. We have uh, 157 badge employees that work directly for the commission. 2,500 people uh, are badged on that campus that are impacted, uh, that, that are impacted by the ability to work in the airport. John's going to come up and talk about the, what we're doing, where we're doing it, uh, when we're doing it. The question is, the challenge I have is the how we're doing it. And I'll come up a little later and talk about how we're doing it because I met with uh, board supervisor and my commissioner, Nelson, and uh, county manager of Atoka some time ago. This has been in the works for a while so we can improve this view corridor at least to and from the airport. The challenge I have is the how to do it because I have limitations in terms of how I can use the funds that are generated on the airport. There are, anytime you accept federal 
dollars. Of course, there are strings attached. Those strings are in the airport community are called grant assurances. And one of the assurances that the abide by is not using airport funds uh, to uh, invest on on projects that are not on airport property. So that's the how challenge, and I think we've uh, collectively been able to come up with a way to address that. So, John. Good morning. Um, Perry said, John Rutledge. I'm the Chief Operating Officer with the Capital Region Airport Commission. To uh, enhance the uh, views along Williamsburg Road, and specifically um, in that area in front of the airport, um, Looking toward the future, we asked uh, our architect to come up with some concepts for the intersection of Airport Drive and Williamsburg Road. The uh, first concept that our architect came up with was uh, the fall line, and all these concepts are intended to give a sense of place for the airport. There are five geographic regions within the state, uh, Richmond Falls on that region between the Coastal Plain and the Piedmont. This uh, would uh, give a, a monument depicting the state of Virginia. Um, it could be internally lit, externally lit, depicting those five regions. Um, all four quadrants of that intersection would be landscaped with the focus going toward, this is, I'm sorry, this would be the fall line. I think it jumped ahead, which gives the uh, um, monumental signage at the entrance, state of Virginia, illuminated, depicting the, the five regions with the uh, Richmond International Airport iconically there, um, internally lit, externally lit. The next concept we call the ringed entrance concept. Um, all four quadrants would have a, a structural ring with light towers that would culminate in a focus toward the entrance at Williamsburg Road leading in to the airport property. Um, as with as I mentioned with the first concept, all four quadrants would be landscaped. The third concept called River Runs Through It, um, endeavors to provoke thoughts of the river beginning at the entrance and ultimately meandering into the airport property. Lighted tower feature in the iconic signage on the southwest quadrant of the entrance, which would be the Williamsburg Road, as you enter to your right, going into the airport. And once again, all four of those quadrants would be landscaped. As Mr. Emerson mentioned, and also Mr. Romanello, um, the Williamsburg Road Development Corridor, we, I won't go into detail on this, but you'll notice there in the outline, the block in the middle drawing, um, a portion of the airport property. We were involved with the um, design charrette with the form-based zoning for the Williamsburg Road Corridor, and we are supportive of it. In fact, the layout um, from the design charrette is included on our approved future airport layout drawing with the FAA. And uh, finally, a concept for uh, the intersection of, we call it Eastside Road and Williamsburg Road. Um, this would be just east of the new Residence Inn Hotel. Um, as development takes place on the east side of the airport, the area of the former Virginia Air National Guard base, um, traffic will probably dictate that there's some type of traffic control there. We've investigated this with VDOT. They've said, we don't want a traffic signal. They prefer a roundabout. So our concept would be a roundabout there as you enter Sandston. And I believe this also would complement perhaps what uh, the county envisions in the future at the other end of Sandston at Seven Pines, in the Seven Pines area at Beulah Road and Williamsburg Road, sort of bookend um, the community of Sandston. Um, with that, Rick. Thank you. As you can see, we are did you take the clicker? You know, we are investing a significant amount of resources in improving that view corridor. And the primary reason is because if you've been keeping up, we're expanding our reach at the airport. Um, so our route map has enhanced, has been enhanced. We have now have 
um, flights that go as far west as San Francisco, Las Vegas, and Phoenix that wasn't previously there. We have plans of um, renovating our Federal Inspection Service. The Federal Inspection Service Center is responsible for um, processing passengers that fly in from international destinations. We are unable to do that right now, uh, but once we finish this, uh, this renovation, in fact, we have a meeting with CBP next week, uh, Customs Border Patrol, to talk about uh, how they're going to staff this, we will be able to entertain um, international flights. We have been courted by a number of airlines who are interested in flying here internationally. So when we finish this, we, we expect to be able to uh, accommodate international uh, flights. Another significant project underway is the consolidation of our checkpoint. As you enter our airport now, you probably are aware, if you've flown there, there are two concourses, concourse A and B. They both have independent um, uh, TSA security checkpoints. We believe that consolidating that checkpoint will create efficiencies that enable to process passengers in a more expeditious manner. Uh, and incidentally, it also provide an opportunity for making more money, but who's thinking about that? Um, so that's another big project we're uh, investing in to enhance um, the processing ability at the airport and thereby affecting uh, our ability to advance the Richmond region. And then finally, how we're going to do this. So as we invest a significant amount of resources on the VIEW corridor, as I mentioned, we are uh, our ability to affect positive social change off the airport is limited. So we have uh, met and discovered a way that we can uh, work or have an impact off airport. And so we have uh, been approved to form uh, a Capital Region Airport Commission Charitable Foundation. And funds that are generated from that foundation can be used for airport beautification on projects that are outside the airport. It can be used for what we call a three-legged stool, which is art in the air. We're interested in performing in visual arts in and throughout the airport. We're interested in what we call ARC, Aviation Reaching Communities, which is the ability to educate the public uh, about airport, provide opportunities for people to learn uh, different trades to work in our airport environment. And then there's also the, uh, the charitable leg, which is uh, the ability to help passengers that are stranded and or employees that have been devastated by some kind of natural disaster or something. So the General Assembly approved that in uh, 2022. We have recently uh, met as a board and our bylaws and our um, articles, of, articles of incorporation have been approved as well. We are now moving towards getting our um, IRS 501c3 status, and uh, I don't think that's going to take that long. That's uh, what we're doing to ensure that uh, the view corridor at and around the airport uh, looks like a place that is welcoming for business to move into the Richmond region. Uh, thank you. Any questions? Yeah, Mr. Miller, I yes. believe the um, the foundation that you're working on was something that you mentioned when you were being interviewed I did. for the job. And I remember you said that this was one way to educate the next generation in how to run an airport. Yes, indeed. So thank you. This well, completes you, you promised and you delivered. Uh, well, thank you very much. I appreciate you. Uh, being on the panel that helped bring, bring me here. So. <laughs> yeah. Questions for me? Any questions from the board? No, no question. I just want to um, thank you, Mr. Miller, and I'm excited about the future of the airport and how the airport is going to work with Henrico County. I think the, I just mentioned to my colleague, the um, if, if there is a way that we could redevelop the entrance of the airport, I think it would um, bring significant value to the airport, but also to the um, Williamsburg Road corridor and East Ham Rico. So um, I've got my fingers crossed for the airport and for us. So thank you, sir. I think you'll be sending a strong message to the rest of the community when we do that. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Represents the capital of our state. So.
we want to make a good impression. So I can see where the state would want to help out. So any other questions? Okay, we're going to take about a five-minute break just to, for refresh. 